Well, it gives me great pleasure to bring up another friend uh, who uh, we run into each other at some other friends' Christmas parties, Hanukkah parties, holiday parties, May Day parties, etc., etc. Mark Rigovin, good morning to you. Greetings, how are you? Let's get close to that microphone. It's great that we've tested this out for so We've been such testing a long it. Period. And we've been talking for a long time about you coming on the radio. Uh, we did talk about sometime getting your dad's photo exhibit. And uh, then your dad passed away. I read the obituary in the New York Times. Uh, it talked about this great uh, photographer of the people, came out of the left, uh, was harassed by the powers that be, and ended up taking pictures. Tell us a little bit about you and your dad and uh, how you've been involved with, uh, well, social justice, social action, probably because your dad and your mom. <laughs> <laughs> well, m most important right now, I've come to talk about the work of my father, who... Uh, came to, uh, to Buffalo, New York, which is my hometown, <clears throat> and came in the, in the late 30s uh, as an optometrist. He graduated from Columbia University and came and uh, started not only to do optometric work, but to organize optometrists into unions. And he got involved... Um, in, in uh, a variety of things and eventually met my mother, got married, and uh, went into the army, uh, was in World War, I, uh, World War II, <clears throat> and uh, really was not involved in any level of serious photography during that period. In the, in the 1950s, in 1957, the House Un-American Activities Committee came to bring my father before the committee, basically to shut him up, as they did with others in, in Hollywood and in other, other cities. And, uh, and this did, it, it, it helped to uh, injure his his practice in optometry, but he was just beginning to do photography. Uh huh. And it was very fascinating. You'll you get a kick out of this. Uh, a man invited him to photograph the cover for a Folkways record album. And. Which cover? Well, <laughs> I've got some old Folkways records. Well, I'm going to go looking. <laughs> <laughs> this one was of the urban holiness churches, some of the black storefront churches in Buffalo. And my father was so thrilled to be able to get back out into the community that he said, yes, I will, I will be delighted to photograph in these churches. And um, so... he. This one person was doing the recording, and my father was photographing, and they went for about a three-month period until the recording was done. But my father, being a progressive, said that he was so intrigued by what he witnessed in these churches that he continued on for three years every Sunday. <laughs> He got the spirit. Hallelujah. He got the spirit. <laughs> <laughs> and at one point, he, uh, there was some criticism of his work. And the criticism was that this is not where our community is anymore, that we have moved beyond the storefront churches, that, um, that we're not doing this anymore. And so my father contacted, of all people, W.E.B. Du Bois wrote to Du Bois and said, I'd like you to see my images. Could I send you a portfolio? And Du Bois said, oh, please come to my home in Brooklyn. So my father drives to Brooklyn and Du Bois said, this is exactly what is going on in our community. These churches offer the, the spirit, the, um, uh, the music, and allows people to go into the trance and, and that this is going to last 
as a, as a valuable sort of component of the black community for long into the future. You know, I had a, um, I had an experience. I was stuck in a snowstorm, the blizzard of uh, uh, 67 it was, actually. And I was stuck in uh, over near Gary, Indiana in a Holiday Inn. We had made it that far. Uh, I was with a couple of uh, young southern white guys uh, out of Uptown. We were bringing a car back. Someone had donated to our project. And um, there was an old guy who was on the bus that was headed for Chicago named Skip James, who was a blues singer. And... Um, he, uh, he st I got him to start playing. And all of the young African Americans at the time who were kind of listening to Motown, they turned up their radios. They, they didn't want any part of this. Uh, and then I said, well, this guy is an important figure, you know, in the history, blah, blah, blah. So we got to have a little concert from him. But uh, it's so great that your dad captured these pictures. Uh, your dad... Uh, Got quite a bit of renown as a photographer. I mean, the New York Times, when he passed away, they definitely uh, they talked about him. Uh, this was before this woman in Chicago, Helen Meir, I believe, believe her name is, just got a lot of recognition as a, a kind of a street photographer with treasures of the people who were untold. Your dad was a little better known beforehand, but uh, tell us about how his life proceeded. Uh, you know, he'd been in the left. He, he told us about going to see W.B. Du Bois. Uh, he's got some books that have been printed, but uh, you say most of them are out of print. Uh, share some more information. Well, my father is really best known for uh, a series of what was called triptychs or, or quartets where he started in 1972 to photograph in a neighborhood in Buffalo called the Lower West Side. That is exactly the, the makeup of, um, uh, of some sections of Chicago. <clears throat> and he went to the community and photographed uh, for about a four year period <clears throat> and then left for about eight or nine years, came back to that same neighborhood and basically photographed the same individuals and the same homes, the same families for a 30-year period, for three decades. Wow. He also did something that was interesting where he went uh, to factories, steel mills, and foundries in Lackawanna and Buffalo. These are places that no longer exist. That, that institution was outsourced to China or some other place. <clears throat> and he f not only photographed people at the workplace, but he went to their homes. And he realized that by photographing people at their homes, that he was witnessing a lot more than a worker just at their workplace. And so he then realized after a while that he could go back to these people eight years later uh, just to say hello to the people, see how they're doing, and recognized that there was not one of the workers that he had photographed who was still employed in one of those mills. That every single person who at one point had had a uh, a job for $18 an hour and a, in quote, good union job was now happy to be making eight bucks an hour at a McDonald's if they could. All those mills were completely leveled. So, you know, that's, that was an exciting thing. The Home and at Work series, he did a, a project with Pablo Neruda where he went to Chile and worked on an island. Uh, with uh, on a project with Neruda. It's very exciting. Very uh, you're exciting. listening to Live from the Heartland on WLUW 88.7 Chicago Sound Alliance. I'm Michael James. I'm hosting this morning's edition and I'm talking with my friend Mark Rigovin and we're talking about the photographs of his dad Milton Rigovin. Uh, Mark, what, where are all the photos? What kind of shows are up these days? What kind of reprinting of the books? What are you planning to do with these archives? Well, I'm really happy to be on today with you because at the end of this month, the 30th of this month, 
at Roosevelt's Gage Gallery, one of the most important exhibits of his work is coming down. So you've got another three weeks. Oh, good. 18 South Michigan Avenue. It's a really wonderful exhibition. They worked extremely hard. And um, the Library of Congress holds all his negatives, all his contact sheets. The Center for Creative Photography in Tucson, Arizona, has the master collection of photographs, about 3,400 images. So it's exciting that these places are safe and, and, uh, and, and available for researchers. Oh, that's great. But as important, as far as I'm concerned, on the website for my father, which is just simply MiltonRagovan.com, um, you can see about a thousand images. You can see uh, sections that we have built for classroom teachers on how to use my father's photography in the classroom. We have teacher's guides. So it really helps you understand who my parents are, how they worked, you know, why they did their work that they did. Well, you know, you and I talked once about getting your dad's stuff up in here, and I'm going to keep twisting your arm. We'll there, do there it. is a we'll fa do it. great. There is a great photographer named Sid Harris, who was one of the uh, members of the Abraham Lincoln Brigade, and he has some wonderful photos. They're going to come in the fall, uh, so we're going to keep the good photos coming here at the Heartland. You know, I just uh, came back from visiting my mom. She's uh, just turned 97, and she's getting. Um, She's having a hard time moving around, but she's certainly sharp at times. I'm just curious to know what it was like with you uh, as your family aged and your dad aged. How long was he lucid? What was it like? Uh, did you spend a lot of time? Share those kind of personal moments with us, Mark. My father passed away uh, January 18th at 101. My mother passed away uh, in 2003. And that really injured my father on a number of levels. He probably had little TIAs, he lost a lot of memory, but he really, uh, he enjoyed life as well. Once he passed that six month mark of the loss of my mother, we, re we recognized that he was going to keep going, that he was gonna survive. <laughs> Good. <laughs> my sisters and I, we live, and my wife, we all live out of, sh out of uh, Buffalo. And so we would each come for two, three, four day periods into Buffalo weekends and care for my father. And then we hired caregivers who would also help, individuals who eventually got to know each other and love my father. So every morning, I mean, just to give you a sense of who my father was, he was not ye typical sort of comatose person who you do care for. Right. Uh, and that, I'm not, you know, that's not a... Every morning he would be reading Pablo Neruda with the caregivers. <laughs> he read for over a year's period the... Um, Three volume set of um, of Vincent Van Gogh, his letters to uh, his brother Theo. That is one hell of a collection. But my father was very interested in artists who who had a concern and a love for poor and working people, and so. So it was a joy to really to be with to be with my father. You know, we used to joke with people uh, who would come to restaurants with us and say, you know, do you have a problem with my father singing love songs to you in a restaurant? And they would all blush, and I would say, well, when's the last time your husband or your boyfriend or your lover sang a love song to you? And everybody would say. <laughs> so it was really, it was exciting, and really up until probably four or five days before he passed away, he was singing away. It was beautiful. He was singing Charlie Chaplin songs. You know, he was singing, and the f interesting thing is, we come from a folk, you know, folk folks. He was singing John Lennon. 
which which blew our mind. But it was exciting. It was exciting. Oh, that's good. Well, those are those are wonderful times to spend with a, a parent who's uh, going down to the next great spirit world. Uh, you know. You, uh, you have a lot more to talk about than just uh, your dad. Uh, you're uh, an activist yourself. You've done a lot of good things. Uh, you and I just uh, remembered when we, I don't know if it's when we first met, but uh, you ended up doing set designs and flags and stuff in Andy Davis's movie The Package with Gene Hackman, which I played the Nazi goon in. Uh, and uh, you can hear me yelling on the screen, come and get it, you effing... It's commies. What was that? What was that? I can't say that on the air. <laughs> and um, but no, uh, you can rent that today. That film. you can get that movie. Yeah, I don't. I'm, you know, I hated doing that part. But Andy said, "Well, you know, good actors they they take on these rough roles." But the other thing that you've done, besides let's not get the harbor on the films, you were, you're involved with uh, the Illinois Labor Historical Society, and there's a new book out. The day will come, and uh, we're going to have to save that for another time. Okay. And so I'm inviting you officially, Mark Rigovin, to come back on Live from the Heartland. Wonderful. He'll probably do it around the time when your dad's photos go up here. And we'll, we'll have a little bit of talk about your dad again. And then we'll uh, get right into this stuff on your labor history. Because you really track them down. You, you, where did they go? What did they do? Where, where are those ashes of Joe Hill? Where, where did they are meander? they? <laughs> where are they? I thought they were over there at the old Wobbly Hall on... Uh, uh, Fullerton, some Lincoln, of, and Halstead some somewhere made, that's, that's torn hard. down. I, that used to be the Assyrian, Assyrian American the Assyrian American restaurant over there. <laughs> Thank Anyhow, you very much.